You know, in, in our lives, oftentimes, there's, there's places where there's things, stuff happens, and maybe we had some excitement before, maybe we had some life before, but all of a sudden, things just feel dead, sometimes spiritually, sometimes in our, our families, our businesses, our jobs, and there's dead things. There's things that feel dead or look dead or things that look like there's no hope or things that look like there's, there's no better tomorrow, right? As the, the word of God says that sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And oftentimes we're in a place where we can't see that joy's ever going to come. We look and we say, but there's no hope here. It's just dead. It's dry. You know, there's an s- example in the Bible of this in the book of Ezekiel that we're going to look at tonight of a... Uh, It's called the Valley of Dry Bones. And and we're going to pick it up in Ezekiel chapter 37 in verse 1. The Bible says this. The Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the Spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, Son of man, can these bones become living people again? Oh, sovereign Lord, I replied. You alone know the answer to that. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to these bones and say, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I'm going to put breath into you and make you live again. I will put flesh and muscles on you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I spoke this message just as he told me. Suddenly as I spoke, there was a rattling noise all across the valley. The bones of each body came together and attached themselves as complete skeletons. Then as I watched, muscles and flesh formed over the bones. Then skin formed to cover their bodies, but they still had no breath in them. Then he said to me, speak a prophetic message to the winds, son of man. Speak a prophetic message and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, O breath, from the four winds. Breathe into these dry bodies so they may live again. So I spoke the message as he commanded me, and breath came into their bodies. They all came to life and stood up on their feet. A great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones represent the people of Israel. They are saying, we have become all dry bones. All hope is gone. Our nation is finished. Therefore prophesy to them and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. Then I will bring you back to the land of Israel. When this happens, oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord. I will put my spirit in you and you will live again and return home to your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done what I said. Yes, the Lord has spoken. You know, as I was praying about what to speak on tonight, I felt like what what God was wanting to do was to have a night where we're going to prophesy over some dry bones and lives. Because here's what I know about all of us. There's something. There's an area that's dry. There's an area that looks hopeless. There's an area that, 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 that we're losing heart. Maybe if we're parents or grandparents, we have children that aren't serving Jesus or children that are sick or going through some things. Maybe it's things in our relationships. Maybe it's things in our job. Maybe it's spiritually. And we're looking and we say, but there's no hope. I don't see God doing anything. I, I, don't, I don't see it. And a lot of the times when we're in that place, all that's coming out of our mouth is death. You see, in this passage, the first thing we see is a valley of dry bones. We see the death. We see the destruction. We see the hopelessness. We see it, and it's, the Bible says it was scattered all about. How many of you sometimes just think about it in your life? have felt like, man, I'm just overwhelmed and it's a mess. There's so much. There's just this or there's that. Or, or maybe, maybe things are going so well in one area, but all, in another area, man, it's just chaos. 
maybe your work is going well, but your personal life outside of work is just a mess. And all we see is hopelessness and, and dry bones and a valley of death. And it, when we're in that place, it's hard to speak anything other than what we see. It's the people who say, I just call it like I see it. But we don't serve a God who just calls it like we see it. We serve a God who calls it like he sees it. And where you and I only see death and destruction and hopelessness, God says, if you'll speak my word, if you'll start believing me over the circumstance, if you'll start believing me over the death that you're seeing, I can bring life where there's death. I can bring something new, but it starts with what we speak. And if we're not speaking the word of God over the situation, there can be no more hope. If we're only calling it like we see it, it sounds good, but Pastor Stevie, there's, it's death. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's awful what I'm going through. It's, it's not fun. I don't enjoy it. What does he say to Ezekiel here? He says, hey, here's what you're going to do. You're going to look at those bones and you're going to speak a prophetic message to them. You're going you're gonna to tell them that they're going to come alive. And when he began to speak what God told him to speak in obedience, the Bible says all of a sudden there was a rattling. The ground was shaking. There's some noise happening. You know, it reminds me of the story when uh, Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal and it hadn't rained. And after he, God showed up and showed that he was the one true God, he says, hey, go tell them I hear the sound of rain. When God begins to move, there's a sound. It's a sound and it's an awakening. And I think for so many of us, what God wanted to do this evening is to awaken the things that have died. <laughs> awaken the things that maybe others have caused and that we have caused. Some of the things are in our control and some of them are out of our control. Some of us look at some things as dead in our lives because of ways we were raised. Because maybe we were in a, a, a position where people responded horribly. Tonight, as we think about this, we're going to get a choice to respond. You know, I use an equation in, it, it's in life, but I do it in my mental coaching, E plus R equals O. Event plus response equals outcome. For the most part, we don't have any control over the events that happen to us in our lives. Events happen, stuff that's out of our control. And we also don't control the outcome. The only part of that equation that we control is the R, our response. And here's what's interesting about a response, is your response actually becomes an event for somebody else. If you as a parent, your kids do something, and you respond extremely negatively, and you're yelling and screaming, and you're going at them, and you're doing all this, guess what you just created for them? An event. Oftentimes a bad event that now they have to figure out a response to. And then because they're little, they don't know how to respond, and then they respond negatively, and then guess what happens to us adults? We keep responding even more negatively. The way you respond to circumstances in your life becomes an event for somebody else. So the way that you and I respond to dead things in our life will preach to people watching us. It will be an example to people watching us. So the question becomes, when those things happen, are we going to respond with speaking death and showing anybody that's watching us that this is how we deal with it? We, we just sit and have a pity party. We sit and keep calling it death and we keep speaking death. Or do we choose the God response and begin to speak the word of God even though we don't see it? That's what faith is. Believing when we can't see. That's what hope is. Believing when we can't see. The Bible says in this earth and on this life, 
we only see in part and know in part. We don't see the whole thing. And oftentimes because of what we're seeing, we give up. Even the cultural battles, spiritual battles that are going on in society. When we look at them, do we just see the death and destruction and give up hope? Or do the people of God do what happened in Ezekiel and start to speak life and allow God to breathe into it and then become, it said, it said when he did that and they all got, the, the, the bones all came together and the, the, the muscles and the tissue and then the skin and all of that, it said they rose up what? As a mighty army. So what happens is when you see death but you choose to speak life over it and to believe life, what happens is the person next to you that's also attending church with you or around you that's a believer in God starts to see your faith and their faith is now encouraged and they begin to speak life and then the next person begins to speak life and the next person begins to speak life and the next person begins to speak life and all of a sudden it's like a domino chain reaction and the entire valley of death becomes a place where we're praising God and speaking his word over the stuff, over the death, over the setbacks, over the circumstances. That's what he was telling Ezekiel here. So I know you see the condition. These bones that once had life. These bones were there because before they did have life. But because Israel had, was in exile and is in exile, there was hopelessness. Where is God? God's left us. Let's just do nothing and die. So before there was life on these bones and now all of a sudden they're lifeless and they're scattered. And sometimes that, our spirits can truly feel like these dry bones. Anybody ever been in that place, man, where you just feel like your spirit is just Nothing there. I've been there a million times. Where it just feels like, man, I'm just dry. Maybe it's your dream that's become like dry bones. Maybe it's your relationship, your joy, your peace, your faith. But I need us to remember that our God is a specialist, and He's a specialist in bringing things back to life. So, first, we have to understand in this story that God has power to revive and restore. There's scriptures and things we're gonna take back what the enemies stole. I remember singing a song as a kid, uh, and we sang it in church like, I went back and got what he stole from me. I went to the enemy's camp, and uh, y'all know, y'all, some of y'all remember that song? Some of y'all OG church? Yeah, some of you vets. <laughs> I don't, I don't even think I sang it right because I haven't heard it until right now. It came back in my head like, I remember that song. We're going to march up in there like an army and just take back what he stole from me. And we used to sing it with some passion in church. Man, let me just tell you something. Worship music today is so much better than when I was a kid. <laughs> some of the old people in the room are like, oh, no, this stuff, this new stuff. Oh. I, just, I just don't like it. Well, I do. And I heard some of y'all's old stuff. But I remember it because it had a lot of good word in it. But, you know, the, the musical compilation wasn't always the best. And I feel like church world singers have gotten so much more talented than they used to. I remember the people, man, we grew up in small church, okay? My dad, th this wasn't always our church. And bless their hearts, people would sing. And they thought they could really blow. And they sounded like me, you know, like, but when you're small, that's all you had. It was like, oh, I remember being a kid, like almost wanted to apologize to my friends. Like, it's not usually, well, okay, it is kind of this bad a lot of times. <laughs> you ever done that, inviting someone to church and you're like sitting there apologizing to them? You know, uh, you know what I love about our church? You ain't got to apologize for it because we know, like, we know what we're about to say. We know. I have people tell me all the time, hey, man, I... Pastor Stevie, I brought my friend. You, please, you know, don't say certain things tonight. And I'm like, that's, geez, that, that's the worst thing to tell me. I'm a preacher's kid. Like, I, I'm Nemo. You told me not to touch the butt, and I touched the butt, okay? <laughs> if you haven't seen Nemo, 
because I know some people are like, oh my. He called the boat, the butt, and he went and touched it. And his friend's like, he touched the butt. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. Second thing we need to understand from this story is that the word of the Lord is powerful. He didn't say, look at it and just say what you think. He told Ezekiel, say what I tell you to say. You say, well, I don't know what to speak over it. Start getting in the scripture. There are scriptures to speak over your life. There are scriptures to speak over the dry, dead things. You say, well, what can I speak? Go read Ezekiel every day. Look at those dry bones in your life and start to speak this. Say, I am the Lord and I will restore. God's going to revive and restore. We've got to begin to speak God's word. over. Why? Because the Bible says it's alive and active. It says the word of the Lord does not come back void. That's why the Bible says there's power, the power of life and death is in the tongue. What you say and what I say matters. I know some of us are like, man, I've been saying a lot of stuff over this stuff. And you're feeling like overwhelmed. All you got to do is start changing it. You can't make up for the fact that you've said death over it and spoken death. All that matters is you change it. Because that's where the grace of Jesus comes in. That no matter what, no matter how much we've spoken death, if we begin to speak the life of Jesus, just like when we took communion, his blood and his body are bigger than even our negative sayings. It's bigger than the death that we've spoken. We just have to start to change it. It's not going to happen unless we do something. It's not going to change unless we change. We have to understand that the word of the Lord is powerful. The dry bones came to life at the proclamation of God's word by Ezekiel. The man of God spoke it. If you're a follower of Jesus in here, you are a man or a woman of God. When you begin, when you begin to speak God's word over it, all of a sudden things can start to shift. There can start to be a rattling, a shaking, and things that you're looking and saying, but it's scattered. All of a sudden, God starts to order it. Why? Because the Bible says the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. It says, when you acknowledge me in all of your ways, I will lead and guide and direct your paths. Speaking the word of God is acknowledging that God is bigger. That God's bigger than our doubts, our insecurities. He's bigger than our setbacks. He's bigger than our failures. He's bigger than what somebody did to you, what somebody said to you. See, a lot of us are walking around dead inside because of what's words that have been spoken over us by humans. God's word is bigger than a human's word. Some of us are carrying insecurities because of things that were said to us as we were raised or whatever. And God says, quit believing that crap. Because you know what that is? It's crap. You know what you do with crap? You put it in a toilet. And you know what you do once you put it in a toilet? And you don't go try to get it back. I know some of y'all done probably flushed a ring down the toilet and it's gone. That thing is gone. You're not going to go in the sewers and try to get it. That, I mean, that only really happens in movies. And every time it happens, I'm like, that is not, no. It's wrong. Like, that's Ninja Turtle stuff. That is not human stuff. <laughs> That's what I believe God's wanting to tell us tonight. Take all that junk and throw it in the tr trash. Throw it in the toilet and flush it. Get rid of it. And start to speak my words. Start to speak the promises of God instead of the death that you're seeing or the death that you've experienced. Why? Because the word of God is powerful. When he began to speak God's word, it said the bones started to shake and started to come together. To where it formed from scattered bones everywhere into fully formed Skeletons. Ezekiel could have looked at that situation and said it was hopeless. But what, what did God tell him to do? He said, prophesy over these bones. Speak the word of God to those dead places. So I don't know what dead situation you're facing today. 
But I want to encourage you to start speaking life. Start speaking God's word over it. Your words prophesying God's promises can cause a shaking and a coming together of the broken and disjointed parts of your life. The last point on this is then when we begin to do that, we get the promise of God's spirit. Just like the dry bones, we may do all the right things but lack the breath of life. Remember in Ezekiel it said, they all came together, the muscles, the tissue, the skin, it, they were fully formed. But it said they were still lacking life because it, they needed the breath of God. When God created Adam, the Bible says as he put them together, the last part that he did was he breathed his own life into him. And when that happened, Adam came to life. And that's the spirit of God. And so in this thing, he says, okay, they're, they're there, but they're lifeless still. He says, speak to them that my breath would enter them. It wasn't enough for the bones just to come together to be covered with flesh and skin. They needed the breath of God to live. That was verses 8 and through 10. You and I may be going through the motions. Your life may look good on the outside, but you're lacking the breath of God to really live. You and I need the spirit of God to awaken us, to energize us, to bring us to life in Christ. What the breath of God does is it brings new life to our dry bones. So not only do we need to speak over these things, but we need to say, God, I need to be full of your Holy Spirit. That I can have your breath in this place. Not my own, but your breath, God. I'm gonna invite you in to speak. Speak to me, speak through me. Reinvigorate my spirit, reinvigorate my life. You know, when we oftentimes feel empty spiritually, it's because we're not inviting the presence of God into our lives. It's because we're doing the right things, but we're not inviting God in. See, because we can do the things, we can speak the word of God because we might know some of it. You can even pray a little bit. You can attend church. You can do the right things, but if you're not actively inviting God's presence in, it's all just bodies. And maybe for some of us, it's fully formed, but there's no breath of life in it because we haven't invited God's spirit to move. We haven't said, God, I need you to breathe on it. Maybe somebody in here, you've been working on a business and it seems like it's not happening because you've not asked God to breathe on it yet. You've done everything you can and you're like, I just don't understand why I'm not. Ask God to breathe on it. Ask God to breathe on your dreams. Ask God to, to breathe on your future. Ask God to breathe on your children. Ask God to breathe on your grandchildren. Ask God to breathe in the areas of your life that he wants to resurrect. Ask him to breathe. He wants to do it. He wants to revive. That's what he does. He's the God of restoration. When we sinned and separated ourselves from him, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, be put in the grave, and raised to life again so that he can restore us to himself. He's the God of resurrection. He's the God of restoration and you may say but preacher it's too much I've messed it up there's just too much and God is saying if you're still breathing it's not too much if you're still breathing I just need you to hold on I just need you to hold on because I got something for you I'm going to put life in it but I need to know that you're serious about it See, some of us, we do it. We pray over it once, and it doesn't happen right away. And then we say, well, guess God's not in it. Some of y'all laugh, because you know. You've done it. Well, it didn't, it didn't fix right away. Well, were you serious about it? Did you actually want that thing? Because I feel like if you did, and I feel like if I did, I would keep praying about it and keep speaking over it. Some of us expect, man, I'm gonna pray once and ask God to breathe on it once and man, he's just gonna do it because he's my personal genie. <laughs> we ain't playing in Aladdin. He's not like, just rub the lamp, I got you three little wishes. There's gotta be a perseverance to us. 
A perseverance to our prayer, a perseverance to speaking life, a perseverance to speaking God's word over it, even when we don't feel like it. When we're not seeing the result that we want, keep speaking, keep inviting, keep speaking God's word, keep inviting his presence, keep inviting the Holy Spirit to breathe over it. There's, there's got to be a toughness and a grit and a perseverance to us. The kingdom of heaven is awarded to those who endure not who just pray once and expect that, oh man, nothing happened. He said it's given to those who endure. Endure means we gotta keep going through it. We gotta keep going. We gotta keep speaking. We've gotta keep trusting. We've gotta keep believing. Some of you in here, wherever you're watching, you got saved finally later in life simply because somebody kept praying for you. It's, it happens. You... We've seen it. All of us, in some way, have probably experienced it. Listen, the fact that you are sitting in church tonight and still breathing is the very grace and nature of Jesus. And each and every one of us are here tonight because somebody prayed. Because somebody believed. Because somebody thought enough of you to either raise your butt in church or to invite your butt to church. And said, you're going to sit your butt in this seat next to me, and you're going to listen to this crazy preacher. (laughs) We're all a result of somebody that didn't give up. So then I always ask, who's counting on you to not give up? Who's counting on you to keep speaking life? Because if you give up, everybody watching you is going to learn the habit of giving up. God did not create you and I to be quitters. He created us to be champions and conquerors and overcomers. It says we overcome the evil one by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Another way to look at our testimony is the blood of the lamb and our scars, our battle wounds, our hurts, our pains that we've overcome, that we've had faith in God and God saw us through. That's how we overcome the evil one because when he comes back, we say, hey, You thought you had me. This hurt. I got a nice little scar right here. But you know what that is? It's a scar. You know what a scar represents? That it was once an open wound, but I kept staying connected to Jesus. And because I did that, he began to stitch it up. And it scabbed, and then it peeled, and now it's a scar, and it's a representation of something I overcame. I've had had four major knee surgeries on my left knee. So I got, I got a nice scar. I mean, it's nice. A big old scar. And every time I look at it, I'm like, dang, I, I, I was dealing with that. I got hurt when I was 15 years old. I've spent a lot of years with a bum knee. I was 23 years old and they were talking about a knee replacement. I was like, I thought that was only for people like 60 and above. And then they're like, oh, by the way, you were born with a birth defect. I was like, oh, thanks. Actually, what's funny is the first doctor that looked at it, he he thought he was really smart spiritually. It was cute. Old old guy. He didn't come to our church, so it was real cute. But I went to him, and he looked at the x-rays and all that. And he, he, instead of just admitting that he wasn't good at what he does and that he couldn't find it, He's like, man, I'm looking at everything and I just can't figure. He's like, you know, Stevie, this just might be one of those things, you know. The Apostle Paul had a thorn in his flesh and maybe this is just your thorn. I mean, guys, I was 22, 23 years old. You think I'm mouthy now? I was way mouthy back then. I looked up at him because he knew I was like the youth pastor here. He knew he knew my dad's name, our church. So he's trying to give me this whole Bible lesson, old guy. <laughs> I remember looking up at him and I said, I'm Henri. So I said, sir. And I didn't say with all due respect because I didn't have any at that moment. <laughs> at least I said, sir. I said, sir, let, let, let me just help you. Don't ever try to quote the Bible to me because you can't figure out what's wrong with my knee. <laughs> He just looked at me. <laughs> so I said, 
the, 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 it was New Mexico Orthopedics, and they have a bunch of doctors. So I said, I want a different opinion. Like, I want to see somebody else. You know what's interesting about it is because I was frustrated about my knee and just my whole life, it, it caused a lot of issues for me. And so I was frustrated about it. For me, it was a dry bone area of my life. And so after his very educated opinion um, and biblical lesson, I said, I want a second opinion. But I did something specific between his appointment and the next one. I began to pray differently. The first one, I really wasn't praying. I was just mad. I was frustrated. I'm like, I keep getting hurt. I actually heard it. I was training for a jiu-jitsu tournament. And uh, Pastor Joe, actually, over at East Campus, was trying to show me some wrestling takedowns. And unfortunately, Pastor Joe doesn't know how to, like, show without breaking things. <laughs> and so he shot in on my, on my left leg. I'm not ready for it. It's dark. We're in my parents' backyard in the grass. I'm just kind of standing there, and he was like showing me something, and I didn't know he was about to attack me. And he comes up, and he, he just, and my, my, my shoe got stuck in the grass because of the friction, and pop. You should have seen the look my dad gave him. <laughs> my dad was like, what, what, what just happened? Because he knew I, I, I'd already broken this knee so many times. He was like, again? Poor Joe, he's like, I just, I just, I, I just, I just. I love Pastor Joe. He's fantastic. <laughs> I really do. Pastor Joe's great. It was an accident, but it was, I like to, no, we're past it, so I blame him. It's great. <laughs> so it happened then, I, 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 and then I, I wasn't really praying about it because I was just like, again, like, I thought the last surgery fixed something. This is terrible. I hate this. I didn't really pray about it. I was just complaining and speaking death. But what I did between the first appointment and the new doctor, I literally started to pray this, right? Because we pray for miracles. We pray, God, just miraculously fix my knee. I remember I went to this like prophetic thing and this guy, I don't know, it was kind of weird. He was like, he's like, I think something's with your knee. And this was before the first one. And he's like praying over it all weird. And I was like, what are you doing, bro? You watch too many documentaries. Okay. Like nothing happened. And I'm like, see, these people are kooky. But I began to pray. Instead of complaining or just saying, whatever, whatever happens, happens, it's, it's hopeless, it's useless. I literally started to pray and say, God, I pray that in the name of Jesus, you would give this doctor wisdom and that he would see something that nobody else has seen. And that's what I prayed every day. I prayed it literally every day. God, show him something that nobody else has seen. Show him something that nobody else has seen. So we did another MRI. He, he takes a look at it and I'm sitting in his office right, after he's done all the stuff and we're sitting in there and he goes, man, I see that you have no cartilage behind your kneecap because that had all eroded away, so it was bone on bone. And he goes, so I see that. And he goes, I see that they tried to do the microfracture surgery and I can see all that. He said, but man, I, I can't, I don't, I don't see anything else. And I'm like, crud, nothing? And we're sitting in there and it was the coolest thing. I, this had to be a God moment because this is what I was praying. It, it, it's just wild to me because I'm sitting there on the, the bed in the, the little, you know, doctor's office and he's standing up and he, he, he's like, yeah, I don't see anything. And he just starts staring at the pictures. I'm like, well, and I'm sitting back there like losing hope, like, oh, crud. This, this is just knee replacement. Like, we're going to have to figure something out. He looks at it and he goes, wait a minute. I was like, what, 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 wait a minute. He goes, I see something. And I'm like, what do you see? Like, I see it too, but I don't know what I'm looking at. I just, I can tell that's an MRI of my knee, but I don't know. And he goes, your kneecap is misaligned. He goes, literally, that's a birth defect. He goes, so your problem is that we need to do a surgery to fully realign your kneecap and then put some cartilage in and do it. It was a major surgery, and he's like, it's going to be a big surgery, two-year recovery, like crazy. But he was like, I see it, and it was funny to me, and I, it really built my faith because I was like, at the last moment, like I'm about to leave the doctor's office because he said he didn't see anything, and I'm like, well, at least he was nice about it and didn't try to lecture me biblically, okay? And he, it was no lie, I'm sitting there and he just, I see something. I was pumped because he saw something, and I literally said, man, God, 
because I trusted you, you showed him something that could help me. Now, my niece still struggles, whatever. I mean, we all have something physically all the time. Because even if God miraculously heals you, you understand that you're still one day closer to death. Like, we're still dying even if he fully heals us. Because the Bible says it is appointed for man once to die. Our bodies are slowly decaying. But our spirit is what will live forever. And I just thought it was interesting to me that, man, God... Even, even, even something that some of us could say, man, that was small. In my world at the moment, it was big. You may think that your thing is too small for God, but it's not. And if you'll speak life, he can bring other people across your path that can see something and help you get to the next level if you're willing to speak life where there's been death. If you're willing to look at the dry bones and say, hey, you gotta come together. Death is not the path that God has for me. He has life and life to the fullest. That's what Ezekiel was saying. I'm gonna do two things tonight. The first one is maybe you don't have any life in your life because you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. You never asked him to come into your life to change you, to transform you, to help you, to heal you. And maybe tonight you need to say for the first time, Jesus, I give you my life. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Maybe you've given him your life before, but you've walked away and you say, tonight, I need to recommit my life to Jesus. I need to say, Jesus, I'm gonna give you my life. Be my Lord. Maybe you just say, preacher, I don't know if I'm right with God. I don't know if I was to leave the earth, whether I'd be going to heaven or hell. And I don't wanna leave tonight not knowing that I'm right with Jesus. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me, if that's you and you're watching here or at any of our campuses or online, you say, preacher, that's me. I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to ask him to come into my life to help me, to forgive me, to be my Lord, to be my Savior. If that's you and you're in either one of those places and you say, preacher, would you just include me in your prayer that I could receive Jesus right where you're seated, if you would, just so I know who I'm praying with, if there's anybody at all, right where you're at, if you would, just raise your hand. If you say, preacher, that's me. Thank you, I see that hand. Thank you, I see this hand. Thank you, wow, wow, thank you. Thank you, I see that hand over there. Thank you, I see this hand right here. Thank you, I see that hand up top. Thank you, I see those hands. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, I see your hand. Is anybody else as a preacher, just include me in your prayer. That I could make Jesus my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you raise your hand, I'm gonna ask that you would do me a favor. I'm gonna ask that you would repeat this prayer after me aloud so you can hear your own voice. More importantly, I'm gonna ask that you believe it in your heart. For those of you that Jesus is already your Lord and Savior, if you would also pray this in support of those who raised their hand, if everybody would, say, Father, I come to you now seeking salvation. So right now, I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord, that you sent him to down the cross for my sin and that you raised him from the grave. So Jesus, I give you my life. I ask that you forgive me of my sin and that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me and guide me in all your ways and in all your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.